to uh, the role of uh, diversity data. Already we're going to make diversity data for monitoring programs and effect, uh, effect, uh, monitoring and, if, um, and looking at effectiveness of policies and programs. You have already mentioned uh, you have already statistics that show what you what you are doing in terms of conservation protected areas, the benefits, how effective you are. You think uh, your data is uh, doing what you need? Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, before I respond to your, your question, you allow me to go to a good question that uh, the, the gentleman from Osana asked, but still in relation to actually what you're asking. Uh, I want to bring a little bit of controversy here, and I don't want to pretend that everything is okay. This what has been done great in the environment, but when it comes to biodiversity data building, I think Thurman and Zell, you need to agree that we, we, we need to build from uh, probably we have this information, but very scattered in various institutions. So I think uh, uh, streamlining we need to build from scratch and build something that helps us actually answer what he's been asking. Before we convince uh, policymakers, makers, I think uh, is what, what needs to be done first. What needs to be done first is consolidating, building data that is complete, that you can base on to make decisions. So doing that is what is required. And what is required are some of the few things that are highlighted here. The probably establishing data sharing framework and uh, organizing that uh, related uh, platforms. Uh, I agree on a leading institution. Uh, right now, we don't have a single institution that has this data. Data is now DB, that is in the river, uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, organizations. So we need to have this data consolidated and actually quantified and know exactly what uh, our diversity status is. And, and that also goes to a concern that uh, Dr. Masazera raised. Uh, when we talk of biodiversity, we only think of big mammals, but biodiversity goes beyond and probably actually beyond the national parks. Because when, when they say biodiversity, people only come back to national parks. But this goes beyond. And actually, uh, I think, uh, uh, first, even the second step to uh, having these priorities put together and to do the system. We also come, we need to come back and uh, find who is a partner, who is a stakeholder. Uh, biodiversity affects whatever we do, uh, even the season we see we are in now. Uh, if I would ask uh, the landscapers, aspects probably won't have mass in this house, but what are other aspects or landscapers that influence actually that this photo would help us perfect uh, our biodiversity in better shape? So I think. Uh, before we even think of uh, uh, convincing, we need to really build ourselves from scratch and have a better uh, 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 dance system that has what we need to convince. So, coming back to your question, well, we have data, but our data can't actually influence 30% of what should be done in a country. Because the data we have is only in our national parks. And by the is beyond, we need to influence land use and policy makers. Uh, we need to influence how our city is designed to also remain part of what we, uh, the biodiversity beyond protected areas. So I think the data we have is not enough. And we need to consolidate with other data elsewhere so that we have a complete uh, data system. So from the SDG point of view then, um, we know uh, SDG 14, for example, and 15, where 14 talks about oil oceans or critical ecosystems observation, while 15 is about terrestrial ecosystems, sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, I'm wondering, for the context of Rwanda, what you have seen in terms of biodiversity data and monitoring uh, policy and programs, whether uh, appropriate indicators are featuring in the National Statistical System, the National uh, Institute of Statistics of Rwanda, I, I 
has been confiscated, what what have you seen and what's your comment in terms of the world? Thank you. Yeah, in general, <coughs> the big challenge is you know data only indicates more uh, African countries. Uh, I can see this one from our three years journey, uh, 2016, 2017, 18, which we presented during this uh, last June conference here in Kigali. Uh, only four uh, in 10 or 40 percent indicators in the global SDG data framework are accompanied by data in Africa, only 40 percent. See, not you know, uh, 60 percent are not accompanied. If you look at that dashboard, you can see data not available, not available in, in including the CDG 15. Even what is available in terms of quality is question. So that, that is why when we were saying that, you know, what is really uh, our thinking about the importance of data in this sense. Even you to show where Africans are, really African nations are not progressing in achieving this CDG without information. We cannot assist. We cannot say Rwanda is lagging behind in this area so that uh, additional capacity building, additional funding, additional financing is needed. Well, you know, we need that kind of information in order to inform the policy decision makers. That is the problem. The quality of the data. In the beginning of the CDG, you know, you can find all you know, this. Can data gap is the main really challenge in our assessment. In terms of really Rwanda, uh, so far, especially concerning SDG 15, uh, like on that, I think we can see that the country is performing better than many African countries. In fact, there are no issues to be addressed still. But better than not others. In all the you know, cities. That other time I think Rwanda was ranked around AIDS, I remember of all African countries, two countries in terms of all this ranking. Meaning that those countries who are performing well are also have you know data to provide for this assessment. So if we have the information, we put it there, then we inform the decision makers that all the countries that you are here in terms of this thing, so you are doing better, but you are lacking behind. But if all in all, since I've been speaking, uh, the one way is something that no other African countries can learn uh, in this area. Uh, SDG of all SDGs, as in 15, when we look at African nations, uh, we can say that so far the progress is okay, and uh, we are optimistic that by 2030 they can achieve uh, the targets. That is assessment, including the one, even the one that is better in terms of you know, really achieving this in 2015. Thank you. Yes, before we get the uh, questions from input, maybe we can be the uh, comment on uh, the university uh, uh, for informing the policy and programs. Thank you. Um, maybe based on the comments of Sam and Michel um, to provide my comments. So I agree with Michel that we need uh, to also monitor biodiversity uh, that is on the agricultural land. I commend the efforts of RDB in monitoring biodiversity inside the protected areas. But when you look at outside protected areas, we don't know really where, what is going on, where we are using pesticides. How do we make sure that they're not killing 
bees and the birds that are playing a, a big role in pollination. And when we put um, chemical fertilizers in soils, how what is the impact on worms and other soil diversity? It is a question. And also on agriculture, we have uh, some uh, uh, big birds that are also under threat of extinction. Uh, we have vultures and others that also need protection so that we don't use them as a country. So, and for some, I completely agree with you that uh, collecting biodiversity data, analyzing them, and use them to inform decision making in a resolution way helps a bit, but does it help for long term planning? Um, UNDP is trying to support different uh, ministries and electorate uh, generals to address some of the diversity related issues. I will mention a few. For instance, if I start with the Minister of the Environment, they are trying to see how we can put in place a long term monitoring system for environment, climate change, and biodiversity. There is a proposed system uh, that we call um, results-based monitoring and evaluation tool that we are constructing together with my colleague Juliet and her team. Under this tool, and this is a kind of portal that is being used by the, the, the ministry to inform the decisions made on environment and natural resources. REMA has indicators to report on, Meteor Rwanda, the Rwanda Office of Land and the others, all of the subsectors, under the other sector, have their own indicators to collect the data on, on report on, and some of them have already baselines others are trying to conduct baseline studies. I think uh, if we can link, it, link this uh, biodiversity information system with RDNV, we can get a well-integrated system that you can go into and get different data that you can analyze in combination. And this slide, I would also uh, like to say that it doesn't, uh, it is not enough to have a system and baseline. It is important to have clear metrics that you agree upon as institutions. How do we make sure that our data collection tools are consistent? How do we decide together at how often are you ready to revisit or to collect other data for long-term monitoring? I think we are doing a great job, but also I want to do uh, to ensure that we have a way of keeping our consistency in the data uh, management and analysis. And this platform is a one of examples that you can reach there. So to address climate change and the issues related to biodiversity loss on agricultural and in protected areas, we also have the different programs. For instance, in Prema, we are working on a project to restore uh, Mayada ecosystem. So if we plant more trees, we reduce the erosion that pollutes uh, water bodies. This way, we are trying also to restore the university that is there. And we have also another program with the Ministry of Environment on a, a mapping all of the wetlands of the country and develop the wetland master plan. So the master plan will help us to know or to agree on how we better use our wetlands. If we decide to use the wetland for maybe exploitation, how do we make sure that you can sustainably use water that you are putting there? And this transplantation is managed in a sustainable way. 
and how do we decide which wetlands that are going to protect, uh, say, a filter of our, maybe, or, or our, say, uh, an ecosystem that helps us to clean our water bodies and control that. And uh, I jump from climate change, when we go to biodiversity financing. I've been working with Rema on um, finding uh, biodiversity financing solutions that can help the country to get more money in addition to what we get from ecotourism. And we have a list of proposed solutions that we think we can choose some of them that the country can start implementing starting in the next year. And UNDP played a big role in the creation of Monero, the World Green Fund. And this is a country uh, institutional instrument that is already helping to finance biodiversity conservation, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and importantly, to ensure that private, private sector plays a role in addressing climate change issues. So for that one, provide grants and ensures that private sector get uh, loans at low interest rate to have um, good practices that ensure environment protection. And also UNDP uh, supported the development of green growth and climate resilience strategy and we're working together with the Ministry of Environment to review it. And the strategy provides for uh, possible interventions and in the strategies and the paths that should be taken by government institutions, private sector, civil society to ensure that water becomes a climate resilient and low carbon economy by 2050. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So um, I will come to um, the audience for, for comments about what we have discussed. Um, uh, that and then brought up, brought, brought up the issue of data inconsistencies, which myself have noted uh, through the scientific uh, community, uh, for example, about forest, forestry, forest coverage in the country, both in the natural, in the protected areas, but also in plantation forests. Uh, there, there are different figures. From. <laughs> so, uh, as you mentioned, as she mentioned, we need we need to have uh, an agreement between all institutions so that the data from, for example, forests which are which have uh, our biggest uh, species or, or, or genetic or species diversity. I think we could. We could comment on that. Um, also about uh, uh, having data on uh, on the threats on those, for example, those species, bird species, for example, which are not confined to <laughs> to, to protected areas. I know the, uh, for example, there's an NGO that has tried to restore certain parts in agroecosystems for aggressive grains, for breeding and other migratory species. Uh, but the issue of lacking data on no herbicide use or, or plant protection spraying in terms of pollinators remains a big challenge. So, uh, in inviting the audience, members of the audience to comment to ask questions, perhaps we could already look at priorities for data uh, needs and how it can be organized uh, in terms of going forward to build an information system. Uh, so, opportunities uh, going forward. Uh, to translate those challenges into practical, yes. 
So I see yourself and uh, perhaps we, we, we go and count the crocodiles. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Dr. Venus Tetsenimana. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center of Excellence for Biodiversity and Resources Management and the lecturer of Belgium, the University of Milan. I have brief information. We have been talking about biodiversity outside of protected areas. I have started research in those areas. And, uh, we are working on soil and Throughputs. That's another area of biodiversity which you left behind. Because most of the time, as you say, when you really talk about the biodiversity, we're focusing on big mammals, big animals, and sometimes those research are done in protected areas. So our research was done in the banana plantations, coffee plantations, and forest plantations as the major crop plantations and forest plantations in Rwanda. But as you know, uh, it is a starting point. We still have a long time to work on those areas because the big challenge in Rwanda is that we don't have taxonomists. And uh, to identify those small animals, you have to be skilled in identification. So far, what you have done, we tried to do the identification up to the family level for the most of the lotropods, and we tried to go deep for ants only to species level, which is a, for me, which is a big, a big job, because less skills, less information is available about ants in Rwanda. And uh, the panelists talked about the importance of biodiversity. There's a small uh, invertebrates, for example. Ants are very important for soil health and for soil quality as they are soil ecosystem engineers. They, are the, they create the calories, which is very important for soil aeration, for water availability in the soil, for soil nutrient mixing, different soil horizons, and that is a great role for soil invertebrates, which is left behind in most of the research, not only in Rwanda, but also in different countries. So that is, uh, I think, a, a good starting point, and in uh, your records, you may add those research. Some are available already published in good journals, some others in the way we were being published, and um, they were digitized. They the photos for collected ants. It is also another opportunity for one because the race is known about those ants. So we still have a hope that we shall continue doing research in those areas. There was also an issue about the pollinators. That's another area where we need really big support. So we are working on butterflies, which is also another domain of entomology left behind. And as we know, they are among the good pollinators. And there is hope that soon the first data shall be published in the journals. So those two areas are working on, but still the road is a, there is a long journey to come up with good results. That's the information I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Quinto da Philip. Uh, I work for Rwanda and the Forest Authority. So even there, I deal with uh, catchment management. So my question is directed to the uh, We know there are different efforts on going to make inventories of different species. But then I want to know what really can we do in different sectors, what uh, management, forestry, what can we do to speed up the inventory of our biodiversities in the different sectors? Uh, part of this equation, maybe we can go to Peterson. Uh, I know there is new technologies. I remember when I was at undergraduate to take uh, a fry, we're using a net. In terms of technology, what are new technologies that can help us to speed up this uh, uh, inventory? 
So the other question is to uh, Leticia, primary structure. As you know, the population is increasing globally, and those is projected to, 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 to increase. This means that also uh, uh, demands in terms of food also will increase. So my worry is, at the end of the day, people start even eating, even eating out diseases, like varieties or species. Uh, say, for example, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, the insect that helps in the donation, then the system will collapse. So I want to understand what people can do to ensure, yes, the population is increasing, and also the food is available so that we don't impact on biodiversity. Thank you very much. Uh, that they can also monitor, monitor and track 
Uh, why also the grouping framework, like uh, Philip was saying, or the previous uh, the comments uh, on the uh, which indicators we need to have, we also need to have something a bit macro on, on the funding and research. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, I'm not going to go back into the issues, we know them. We don't have enough data, data is scattered, and uh, there's an issue of who's in charge of validating or quality control of that data. And we also have been uh, attending the Environment and Natural Resource Sector Working Group in the past. And when you look at the reports or strategic plans, there is always lack of baseline data. When are we going to collect that information? And that information can help us to think the way forward. When you go into this uh, forward looking or backward looking, there is always a gap in the baseline data. And we know we have uh, the National Academy, the University of Florida, they have all departments, so sociology, uh, chemistry, biology department. These are, it's a manpower. If we strategize it well, there can be a long-term monitoring system where we can monitor all the streams in Rwanda, all the forests in Rwanda. And over time, we can have that information to help make decision making or prediction in the future. But that is, the system is not there. I think in this meeting, we have to come up with some action because next meeting, we don't need to be coming back again. These are the issues. Again, data collection is not the one person who can do that. There is a civil society, there are NGOs, there are international outside universities. Why can't we sit down one time, one day to map out what are the key research questions that are making a teacher not sleep at night or <laughs> Juliet? What are the key big questions we want to ask? And then we put them out there on the web. Any researcher who wants to come to the country will come and apply for research permit. Instead of uh, spending three months applying, you give him in a week he gets his permit or her permit. And then that will be the best way of moving forward. At the end of the day, I would like to ask uh, our friend from South Africa, is the role of uh, the sun, sun vines, sun bin, the quality control, who is in charge of quality control? Because there is a data collected under the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health, at the end of the day we have to understand what are the impact of the environmental degradation on the public health in Rwanda. So who is in charge of quality control? At the end of the day we have to think about that institutional arrangement in charge of quality control and how the data is collected over time because environmental data is not one time, one point in time. It has to be continuous. Thank you.